So, Jane Austen writes the most marvelous romances. These are couples that are meant to be together forever. But what if they're not? What if there is a couple in the Regency era that needs to get a divorce? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about here in today's video. We're going to be breaking down the different ways a marriage could end, the required steps to getting a divorce in the early 19th century, and we're going to be talking a little bit about Mansfield Park because there is a divorce at the end of Mansfield Park and it pretty much plays out like a textbook of divorce in the era. So if you would like to learn all about that, then definitely stay tuned for today's video. Now, before we dive into Regency era divorce basics, though, I want to say thanks to this video sponsor, Brooklinen. So if you've seen my video, How to Be the Mistress of Pemberley, then you know I have a slight Brooklyn and Obsession, and why wouldn't I? Because their sheets are high quality and luxurious and comfortable and very aesthetic. And the good news is Brooklyn and is back with another offer for you guys of $20 off any order of 100 or more. Just use the link in the description down below and my code Eliedashi at checkout. I have both their Linen Hardcore Bundle Sheets, which is currently on my bed, and I also have their Lux Sateen Cotton Sheets. I love both of them. I rotate them every other week and I'm always excited to go to bed now. It's really transformed the way I think about my bed and my bedding materials and has definitely helped my bedtime routine because I'm so excited to go to bed now. The cool thing about their linen sheets is they're 100% linen made in Portugal. It's this really light and airy texture to it that helps you stay cool at night, but also has a total aesthetic appeal. Like it's very aesthetic. Their online shopping experience is also amazing. You get to mix and match different colors and sizes and it's super simple to use. So if you'd like to learn more about Brooklyn, and then definitely click the link in the description below and use my code Eliedashi at checkout for $20 off any order of 100 or more. And now that we've talked about that, let's move on to the scandalous world of Jane Austen divorce. So divorce is incredibly widespread today. It's estimated that 45% of couples getting married in the UK today will end their marriage in divorce. Over 100,000 couples in the year 2020 alone got a divorce in the UK. However, were things always that way? No, no they were not. In fact, as I've mentioned in the video, things you need to know before reading Pride and Prejudice, those in the Regency era thought about marriage and divorce in a completely different way. They viewed marriage as a lifelong bond that should only be ended when someone dies. And of course, this had a lot to do with their religious viewpoints at the time. The only reason someone could get a divorce in the early 19th century was on the grounds of adultery, and more specifically, on the grounds of a wife committing adultery. We're going to be talking more about the sexual double standard later in this video. But these viewpoints were definitely reflected in the statistics around marriage in this era. For example, between 1800 and 1809, only 24 couples in all of England got a divorce. So basically, divorce was incredibly rare, it was very expensive, and it was very exclusive to get. However, these are just the statistics for like a true divorce, where the couple is no longer considered married, they can go marry other people. There were different ways a couple could break up in the era, and we're going to go into those in this video too. For example, a couple could get their marriage annulled. There were also private separations and judicial separations. And then of course, as we've been talking about, they could try for a divorce. Let's start off with annulments. So an annulment was pretty much an invalidation of the original marriage. It was saying, you know what? This marriage that happened wasn't even valid. We're gonna wipe it off the books and act like it never happened. And of course, this left both parties free to remarry. Now, there were several different reasons someone can get their marriage annulled. One was if the marriage was forced or coerced. One of the parties went in against their will. Now, as I've talked about in my video on Elizabeth and Darcy having a prenup, there was an issue in this era called stealing an heiress, where literally a guy would kidnap a young lady who either had a lot of money or land or had the prospects of having a lot of money or land, so she was an heiress, He'd kidnap her, force her into marriage so that he could 
reap all the financial benefits. Of course, this would be a perfect example of a marriage that could get annulled because she was forced into it against her will. Another reason for an annulment was bigamy. If one of the spouses was already married, obviously that invalidated the new marriage. Another problem that could come up is if the couple were too closely related to each other, and this was too closely related to each other in Regency thought. Because as we've discussed before, this was an era where they thought marrying your first cousin was totally okay and normal. However, you could not marry your dead spouse's siblings. So for example, we saw this issue even arise in Jane Austen's own family where one of her brothers married his dead wife's sister. That was technically illegal in the era. Now the idea behind this was they thought a husband and wife became one flesh. So when a man married a woman, they became one flesh and because of that, they shared each other's blood relatives. And this is something we see in Austen's books where they don't really use the terms brother-in-law and sister-in-law the way we do today. Rather, they would call them brother and sister because they really thought like, we're one flesh, we're sharing these relatives, this is now my brother, this is now my sister. And because of that, if one of the spouses died and they marry the sister or brother of their dead spouse, it's seen as marrying their own sister or marrying their own brother. Anyway, this was actually something sort of debated in Regency society of whether this was valid. And of course, one of the issues that did come up and came up with Austin's brother is the fact that sometimes you had a family, the wife died, the sister moves in to help take care of the kids and fill sort of that housemaker role. And then the husband wants to marry the sister, but technically can't. Or they can, and as long as nobody decides to prosecute them over it, they're fine. But you never know when someone might prosecute you over it and force you to get your marriage annulled. Anyway, another issue that could get you an annulment was mental incapacity, or in Regency terms, insanity. Now, very important note on this, you had to be insane on the day of the wedding. You had to not be able to mentally comprehend that you were entering this permanent important state of marriage. Because if you became insane later, like a few years into the marriage, that didn't count because you weren't insane on your wedding day. Or if you were just kind of depressed and on the rebound, if you still understood you were getting married, you also can't claim insanity and get your marriage annulled. That was an issue that was brought before the courts though, of whether if you're just really depressed and down, if you can claim insanity and they said you can't. Another issue that could cause a marriage to be annulled is impotence, or basically the physical inability for a couple to have sex. So if the couple recognizes that this is a problem very, very early in their marriage, for example, on the wedding night, they realize that there's something physically blocking them from having sex, well, then that's something that they could get an immediate annulment for. The husband, if it's on his side, would have to get examined by a medical practitioner and that practitioner would tell the court, yes, there's definitely a physical problem preventing this. Or the same thing on the wife's side, only they would have the older women of the village or the area examine her and give that sort of similar testimony. Now, if it's not a problem that a third party could easily see, then they would have the couple wait for three years to see if during that time, if they could work out their sexual issues and consummate the marriage. If they cannot, then they can get an annulment. So those are the most common issues that could lead to a marriage being annulled. However, as we've noted, a lot of them are pretty rare. Not that many people are getting kidnapped or declared insane. And so most couples did not qualify for an annulment. That left them with these other routes. The next thing they could possibly consider they really want to break up is a private separation. So a private separation was called private because it wasn't done through the court system, but rather it was a private agreement drawn up between the parties that helped them split in a discreet way. They didn't have to air their dirty laundry in front of everyone. However, it was of questionable legality because of this. Some courts would uphold these private agreements and others would not. 
should one of these parties violate this agreement and it has to go to court, you never really knew how the judge would stand on this issue. So a couple having a private separation were still seen as 100% married in the eyes of the law. Rather, this agreement was just laying out the terms of the couple living separate lives. So for example, it would specify how much money the husband would allow the wife as an allowance every year for her maintenance. It would cover how debt would be handled that was accumulated after the signing of this agreement. Also, it could specify stuff like child custody. Something important to remember is that fathers had absolute custody over their children in this era. So anything about custody in these documents would really be the husband allowing access to the children to his wife. Another important thing about these private separations, since they were a legal contract, is that the wife herself could not sign it. A married woman lost her standing in the eyes of the law. She pretty much had no legal rights, thereby her signing a piece of paper as a contract had no legal validity whatsoever. She needed a man to sign it on her behalf. So really these agreements would end up being between her husband and someone guaranteeing her side of the contract, such as a brother or her father. Now, when a couple got one of these private separations, sometimes other people knew about it, and sometimes people just kind of assumed they saw this couple now just living separate lives, and they're like, these people, I think they separated. <laughs> However, if they wanted to make their separation official, they would have to get a judicial separation through the court system. And we're actually gonna talk about that in this next section on divorce because a judicial separation was an essential step toward getting an official divorce. So I'm just gonna include it in there. Okay, are you guys ready to hear the five essential steps to a Regency era divorce? Well, here they are. First up, we have adultery because that was the only acceptable grounds for divorce, thereby that would have to happen, followed by a civil suit, a judicial separation, a parliamentary act, and either the outcome of recovery or shame. So we're going to be diving into each of these steps and we're going to be talking about Mansfield Park in the divorce that happens there because it really does give us insight into Regency era divorce. So up first, let's talk about the first essential aspect of divorce, which was adultery. So originally in this video, I was going to go into this long explanation of the sexual double standard in the Regency era. However, if I did, this video would be way too long. Thereby, I'm just going to sum it up as there was a sexual double standard. Society pretty much accepted that men would cheat on their wives. A little indiscretion was seen as the male prerogative as long as they kept it discreet. Basically, don't flaunt your mistress around town. Because of the sexual double standard, the way the divorce courts handled male adultery was completely different from female adultery. A husband could divorce his wife if she cheated on him because female infidelity was seen as absolutely unacceptable. A woman could not just divorce her husband on the grounds of adultery alone, even though on paper, if you just read the law, it looks like she could. In practice, she really couldn't. A woman could divorce her husband on the grounds of adultery. However, it had to be aggravated by cruelty. And it had to be unusually extreme cruelty because this was an era where a husband had the legal right to hit his wife. Now, a discussion of domestic violence in this era is totally outside of the scope of this video. However, it really did depend upon the judge a woman ended up in front of, whether he would consider something acceptable levels of cruelty or not. There were some judges who were very enlightened and protective of women, and there were some judges that let a lot of stuff slide for the husband. Now, let's bring Mansfield Park into this. Yes, this video is going to have total spoilers for Mansfield Park and I think Sense and Sensibility from this point on, just so you are aware of that. Anyway, Mansfield Park, do we have adultery? Yes, yes we do. We know that Fanny's cousin, Mariah Rushworth, runs off with Henry Crawford at the end of the book, leaving her husband, Mr. Rushworth, angry, upset, and wanting a divorce. And thankfully for him, since it was his wife cheating on him instead of the other way around, he can divorce her. 
What is the first thing he needs to do to pursue this divorce? Well, he needs to sue Henry Crawford for financial damages. So now it is time to discuss criminal conversation cases. So as I've talked about in past videos, another term for adultery in the era was criminal conversation. Conversation meaning sex and criminal meaning illegal as in someone was having illegal sex with someone because they were not married to them. This term was used to describe a form of civil suit called a criminal conversation case. So what was a crimcon case? Well, it was a civil case where basically a husband would sue the man who had an affair with his wife for money. In this case, Mr. Rushworth would be suing Henry Crawford for financial damages. Now, the thought behind this is the fact that a husband deserved compensation because this other man had pretty much stolen his wife's body and affections from him. Also, from a legal perspective, it established that adultery had been committed, and it was sort of like proof of the adultery that then the husband, once winning the case, could take along to the further steps of getting a separation and divorce. Another important aspect of crimcon cases is it was seen as a husband's way to settle his manly honor. So originally, a husband would just go out and duel the guy who had an affair with his wife, right? Try to either kill each other, at least shoot at each other. However, people saw the Crim Con case as a more refined, humane way of dealing with this honor issue of essentially fighting the guy, but in court. And because of this, some husbands who had absolutely no intention of separating from or divorcing their wives would still take the guy to court with a crim con case just to settle up their honor. So if a jury did find the man guilty of having committed this adultery, they would award damages. And sometimes these damages were ridiculously expensive. The guy had no hope of paying. He would either end up in debtor's prison or having to run away to live on continental Europe to avoid debtor's prison. Or he might have to start desperately borrowing money from family or friends. However, that was only if the husband who had been awarded these damages actually demanded payment. Not all husbands did because it could look sort of like dirty money to them, right? It's like, I don't want the money I got just because my wife had an affair on me. Anyway, what were crim con cases actually like? Well, let me tell you, they were decided by a jury, open to the public, and full of gossip. People would attend criminal conversation trials just for the gossip. And some of those people attending would be journalists. And some of those journalists by the 1830s worked for the Crim Con Gazette. So what was the Crim Con Gazette? Well, basically imagine eight glorious pages coming out every Saturday. You only have to pay two pence for all of the latest gossip. We're talking the criminal conversation cases, seduction cases, breach of contract cases, general bad behavior going down throughout the country. And it really would lay out all the scandalous testimony given by servants in a criminal conversation case. Or for example, there were also seduction cases, which is where someone had seduced a single person. So for example, if a young lady showed up pregnant, her parents could be like, hey, who seduced you? And then they could sue the guy who had gotten her pregnant. So for example, this was something that Colonel Brandon could have done when Willoughby seduced his ward Eliza and got her pregnant. He could have sued him for seduction. Of course, does he? No. Of course, we know he goes out the old-fashioned way and duels him. And of course, when we talk about breach of contract cases, that was when a couple was engaged and one of them called it off. That engagement was seen as a contract, even though it was a verbal contract usually, and that breaking it off could result in serious loss to one of the parties and thereby they could sue over that. And this is one of the reasons people had to be incredibly careful when they accepted a marriage proposal or they proposed because you could literally get sued for calling it off later. A great example of where this could have been a problem is again in Sense and Sensibility. Here we have Edward Ferris engaged to Lucy Steele for years, and she was going to definitely financially benefit from marrying him in the end. So if Edward Ferris had broken off their engagement, Lucy Steele would have had the right to go sue him for breach of contract. And the argument there would go like, hey, 
I did not date any other guys. I remained faithful to this guy who was going to give me a home and a life in the future. And then after all of those years and emotions I invested into him, well, he just dumped me. Thereby, I deserve financial compensation for that. Of course, would Lucy have actually sued him for breach of contract? I don't think so. And I think it's the same reason that Colonel Brandon does not sue Willoughby over seduction. People in the Regency era did not like their business being known. They liked to keep things private. They did not want to end up in the pages of the Crim Con Gazette. Even though sometimes there were legal options available to them, they would not use them. Anyway, back to the Crim Con Gazette. They also would publish just general gossip. In fact, they had a helpful column that gave out advice to specific individuals by name. I found this front page warning to a widow rather fascinating. It says, we advise the widow Bert to be on her guard against the artifices of that fool. It looks very suspicious to see the widow's curtain fall immediately after his arrival. We also recommend her to keep a watchful eye on her daughter, or else we think it very probable she will be honored with the title of grandmama. Imagine being Widow Bert and having you closing your curtains make the front page of the Crim Con Gazette and having your daughter's honor also thrown into question and there's threats of grandbabies. Yeah. <laughs> However, if you are just thinking that the Crim Con Gazette's out there enjoying publishing all this salacious gossip, think again. That's not their real motive. As they confidently tell people, they're actually out there to improve morals. Their claim goes that if they publish all the immorality, people will stop committing immorality because they'll be too scared of having it published in this newspaper. This logic, it's just so deep for the Crim Con Gazette. Anyway, back to the Rushworth versus Crawford criminal conversation case. What gossip would be coming out of this case? Well, one is servant testimony. Servants were the main star witnesses at a lot of these things because, you know, servants are hanging around the house all the time. They see all the behind the scenes aspects of life. They know when people are having affairs. And in fact, in Mansfield Park, we read that the servant of Mrs. Rushworth, the mother, had exposure in her power and supported by her mistress was not to be silenced. So Mrs. Rushworth Sr., the mother-in-law, has a servant and that servant saw some stuff and is able to expose this adultery. And you know she's going to be one of the star witnesses at the Rushworth versus Crawford criminal conversation case. Of course, winning this case is not going to be too hard for Mr. Rushworth because his wife literally did run off and elope with the other guy and no one's really going to question whether they had an affair or not. So after winning the case, what does he do? Well, he either decides to collect the damages from Henry Crawford or he does not. But the more important thing is he takes evidence of winning the Crim Con case over to the judicial separation case. And this would be, of course, in front of the ecclesiastical courts. So the English court system in this era was complex and confusing. And as anyone who has seen or read Charles Dickens Bleak House knows, it was kind of crazy. There were three main court systems. There was common law, there was chancery, which is talked about in Bleak House, and also there was the ecclesiastical or religious courts. In this era, the ecclesiastical courts are what handled annulments and they also handled judicial separations. And this lasted all the way up until the 1850s when the Marriage Causes Act came in and created a separate divorce court to handle those things. So a judicial separation was a separation from bed and board, where basically a couple did not have to live together anymore. However, they were still seen as completely legally married to each other. So for example, they couldn't marry other people. If one of them status changed, such as if a husband inherited a title like Lord so-and-so, the wife, even though she maybe has not talked to him in the past 10 years, also inherits that status and becomes lady so-and-so. However, the separation from bed and board was a great protection for the separated parties in that it 
made sure that there was legal protections in place for the wife, such as her husband could not kidnap her back into their marriage because this was an era where a husband could literally kidnap his wife if she ran away from him and drag her back home and force them back into a marital state. But if they were judicially separated, he could not do that. It also stipulated how much money the husband had to give the wife every year as an annual allowance and this is actually a question one of you guys were asking on my video over, I think the one on Darcy and Elizabeth's marriage settlements, about whether in the event of a separation or divorce, did the wife get her inheritance back, right? So if a wealthy heiress brings a lot of money into the marriage, does she get that when they get divorced? And the answer is no. The marriage settlement terms would still be intact if she had her separate estate, like we talk about in that video, obviously, that would be intact. If the marriage settlement settles a lot of money on him or their family, he gets to keep that. However, if she did not have a marriage settlement going in and her husband got everything, he would still get to keep everything. She only gets a small portion as stipulated by the court. Now, we actually see that happening in Sense and Sensibility. So in Sense and Sensibility, Colonel Brandon's older brother ended up married to Colonel Brandon's true love, Eliza. This is Eliza Sr., not the one Willoughby gets pregnant. And eventually that couple of Colonel Brandon's brother and Eliza ends up getting a divorce. And this is what it has to say about her financial situation after that happens. It says, her legal allowance was not adequate to her fortune, nor sufficient for her comfortable maintenance. So Eliza was actually a wealthy heiress when they got married. That is sort of what triggered the whole chain of events in that drama. However, as we see, she did not get a proportionate amount of money out of that marriage when she got divorced. It says it was not adequate to her fortune and it even was not sufficient for her comfortable maintenance or basically it was not enough to maintain her at the status of being a gentlewoman. So back to Mr. Rushworth's divorce endeavor. He gets the Crim Con case won. He gets the judicial separation. What is up next for him on this list? It is to go to Parliament. Yes, I just said Parliament. So England's Parliament was the only group of people who could grant a full-on divorce in the era. And yes, it required hearings in both the House of Lords and the House of Commons. If you want to know one of the reasons why divorce was just so rare back then, one, it required both houses of parliament to debate the issue. Second, it was incredibly expensive. It cost between 600 and 700 pounds to get a divorce. And in a country where poorer families were living on like 40 pounds a year, 600 to 700 was really expensive. And it pretty much required parliament to pass a law. If someone won their divorce case in parliament, they would pass a divorce act that made them officially not married anymore. And this actually continued up and again until the 1850s when that Marriage Causes Act was passed and created the separate divorce court and this was something the members of parliament really appreciated because then now they didn't have to deal with divorces anymore which I just think it's funny that they ever had to deal with divorces that that was part of their job description it's like ah oh, gotta listen to all the drama now what was some of the drama these parliament members would be looking out for while hearing these cases well one thing they really hated was when couples were scheming together to get this divorce so this was a strategy some couples employed which is a husband and a wife would both mutually want a divorce and the husband would be like you know what you go have an affair, make sure the servants see you, let's get this really well documented, and then we can just go through the steps and get a divorce. Anyway, members of parliament were like, no, not on my watch. You can't scheme your way into divorce like that. Something else members of parliament would look out for is whether the husband was a good husband before the wife's adultery. So if the husband had always been really distant or cruel to the wife, and she eventually cheated on him. The members of parliament pretty much looked at that and were like, okay, yeah, your wife cheated on you, but you were a horrible husband beforehand, so you kind of brought it on yourself, so no divorce for you. I just think it's really interesting that they viewed it that way. However, of course, we know that Mr. Rushworth had tried to be a doting husband 
and that he was definitely not scheming with his wife for this adultery to happen. Thereby, as Mansfield Park says, Mr. Rushworth had no difficulty in procuring a divorce. I find it really fascinating that there are two divorces in Jane Austen's books that I can think off at the top of my head. One, this one in Mansfield Park, and the other one in Sense and Sensibility, like we've been talking about. And it's just fascinating because across Jane Austen's whole lifetime, there would probably be only about like 140 divorces happening around her. And yet they're pretty common in her books, relatively speaking to how uncommon they were in real life. Anyway, though, Mr. Rushworth gets his divorce and now it's time to move on to after the divorce. What happens to these people? Well, again, Mansfield Park's reading like a textbook on divorce here with this section, Recovery or Shame. First up, what happens to Mr. Rushworth? Well, thankfully the book tells us. It says, he was released from the engagement to be mortified and unhappy till some other pretty girl could attract him into matrimony again, and he might set forward on a second, and it is to be hoped, more prosperous trial of the state. So Mr. Rushworth is totally unhappy. And again, having your wife cheat on you in this era for men was like the ultimate humiliation for them. They were as a society, very preoccupied with the idea that their wife might cheat on them and they were terrified of it and it happened to poor Mr. Rushworth here. But that's okay because he has hope. He's going to find another girl and they'll be happy. Now, what about Henry and Mariah? I think what happens to them is pretty interesting. And again, we see the total sexual double standard happen. Now, initially, at first, they try to stay together. And that's exactly what his sister, Mary Crawford, wants to happen. And the reason is, is that was Mariah's pretty much only hope of recovering socially if she could marry a wealthy man. If Mariah could have married Henry Crawford, she could have made a social comeback over the course of several years. She would have started hanging out with the more morally questionable high society people who accepted adultery like that. And then eventually she'd continue throwing parties. And after so many years, she'd be a full fledged member of society again. However, that plan does not work out for her. And we really see that in this other quote from Mansville Park, where it describes what happens to them trying to stay together. It says, Mariah was not to be prevailed on to leave Mr. Crawford. She hoped to marry him. And they continued together till she was obliged to be convinced that such hope was vain. And till the disappointment and wretchedness arising from the conviction rendered her temper so bad and her feelings for him so like hatred as to make them for a while each other's punishment and then induce a voluntary separation. So basically, at first, Mariah wants to do this plan of marrying him. Now, something really interesting is that the standard text for a parliamentary bill of divorce included a statement that a wife could not marry the guy who she had an affair with after the divorce is complete. However, parliament usually struck out that clause because they're like, you know what, that's really the wife's only hope here. We're not going to do that to her. So more than likely, that clause would have been totally stricken out of her and Mr. Rushworth's divorce, so she could have technically married Henry. However, Henry doesn't want to marry her. And that really was a problem. Married women getting a divorce sometimes face. Sometimes the guy wanted to marry him. Sometimes the guy was like, yeah, no, just wanted to have an affair with you. Didn't actually want to marry you. Anyway, that's what happens with Henry. However, because she does not have that added level of respectability from marrying a guy of wealth, she is stuck with the other classic outcome for women in this situation, which is just social shame and disgrace living out somewhere in the country. We see that also described in the book where it says, it ended in Mrs. Norris's resolving to quit Mansfield and devote herself to her unfortunate Mariah. 
and in an establishment being formed for them in another country, remote and private, where shut up together with little society, on one side no affection, on the other no judgment, it may be reasonably supposed that their tempers became their mutual punishment. So when it says another country, it literally just means like another county in England, not like France or something. It's still in England, just some remote part that doesn't even deserve a real place name. And we do see she's just stuck with her Aunt Norris living in shame. Now, could she come back from this? Yes, she could, but she would have to find another wealthy man of standing to marry her in order to attempt it. And of course, in her position, that's not as likely to happen. So she stuck out in the country with her horrible aunt being depressed. What happens to Henry? Well, the sexual double standard happens to Henry and he is fine. Yes, he is sad about the fact that he cannot marry Fanny because Fanny's not gonna have him after he ran off with her cousin. But other than that, he has not lost his social position. He's going to make a great match someday. Not as great as Fanny, but you know, he'll do what he can. And it's fascinating the way Jane Austen notes this double standard when she says, that punishment, the public punishment of disgrace, should in a just measure attend his share of the offense. Right? She's saying hypothetically, it should be equal, that this punishment of disgrace should be equal between Mr. Crawford and Mariah. But we know it isn't. Because Jane Austen later adds, in this world, the penalty is less equal than could be wished. And that, my friends, has been the divorce of Mansfield Park. And as we've seen, the five essential ingredients of a Regency era divorce, including adultery, criminal conversation case, judicial separation, parliamentary act, and either recovery or shame. Let me know if you lived in the 19th century, would you subscribe to the Crim Con Gazette? Would you be trying to get all the real gossip of these trials? And also I wanna say thanks again to this video's sponsor, Brooke Linen. I'm still absolutely obsessed with their sheets. And if you would like to become obsessed with their sheets, then definitely check out the link in the description below. And remember you can use my code Ellie Dashi at checkout for $20 off any order of a hundred or more. Thanks so much for watching and keep being awesome. Cause you're awesome. Bye. Looking like a fool. Oh, those nights alone in